Hi, welcome to Audrey Mayer Profile Talk. Hi guys, welcome to the Pro Photo Podcast. Today's guest is my good friend Wyatt Miller. Hi Wyatt, how are you doing? Doing great, hanging so, out here in Baja, California, Mexico. Awesome. So Wyatt, you have been on the top of most of the freestyle competition in the US, but I also know you as someone who came to Cabarete and who has a passion for the sport. I learned so much from your clinic a couple of years ago, windsurfing, when you came here in the Dominican Republic. And I know you have this passion and you love to share it with the people. Absolutely. Yeah, it's been fun doing clinics uh, with you guys in Cap, right? Say it was five years in a row we did. And then uh, uh, my business partner, Tyson Poor, we also do them in a wave sailing spot in Baja. And then we have our own windsurfing and winging center down here uh, in La Ventana, Baja. So do a lot of teaching. You know, this year was big for teaching winging. I learned a ton about how to teach winging down here just because it was the first year that people really wanted to get into it. The last couple of years, people would come to our windsurf center and they'd be like, maybe if it's really light, I'll try some winging. But this year, people were like, I came here just to wing. So we did so much teaching and it was, it was you know, a lot to learn, but there's a lot of good techniques out there. That's awesome. So as you say, uh, Wyatt, you own an uh, operation uh, center in, in Baja where you guys coaching, windsurfing and winging, and you're also the brand manager of Slingshots. So tell us a little bit how a professional windsurfer went into foiling. Yeah, so that was a <laughs> pretty fun story. got a kite foil and we you know as windsurfers we tend to break some windsurf boards and so we had a, a dead DLAM freestyle board and we just drilled big old m6 bolts all the way through the deck and just put a put a foil on there and it wasn't really in the right place so it was quite hard to uh to get going but we got it a little bit and then in the gorge tony lagosh is is uh the head designer for slingshot and the co-founder and he was out there ripping on the wind foil. So of course we're sitting there on the beach waiting for him to come in so we can borrow his stuff. And then he started having us test the gear and uh, you know, we test it and break it and then put bigger bolts in it. And you know, went through so much gear testing with him but that was really the start. We got one, threw bolts of it through, it kind of worked but it was really hard. And then when we got Tony Lagosha's slingshot specific gear, then it was, totally easy and we were hooked and you know right away we're trying to jump and loop and do backflips on it and uh that was probably five or six years ago even yeah i remember you were one of the first person i've seen doing a back loop on a wind foil so how does it feel doing all those those tricks those freestyle tricks on wind foil and wing foil versus on a windsurf board versus on a windsurf board well the you know the big thing for me was just like doing a back loop which is like a back flip in windsurfing has always been one of my favorite you know, favorite things to do in the whole world and uh but in windsurfing you really need like a, a pretty sizable two meter you know in to be able to get the height to do it and down in my windsurf center here it's more bump and jump conditions. There are days where we get, you know, good enough swell to back loop, but generally it's just kind of chop. And with the foil, because you can bring it really low to the water and then in the trough and then hammer on your back foot, you can actually get high enough off of just a two foot chop to be able to do a back loop. So that was like, that's when it really clicked for me when I could, you know, do big back loops in conditions that on a regular windsurfer I couldn't do at all. And then, you know, a lot of the tricks are just about, you know, timing and waiting for that, that wing to actually breach the water. Because on a regular windsurfer, you know, the second you initiate a trick, you're in the air. But there's this big time delay in waiting for the foil to actually breach the water. So it changed the, uh, the dynamic there a bit. And then with winging, honestly, it's so much like windsurfing that 
you know, all of the moves, so many of the moves that I've learned over the years and done 10,000 times in windsurfing, it just applied directly to the wing. Like doing the big Rayleigh thing was exactly like a shove it. Doing the front flip was exactly like a, a forward loop. And we do, you know, carving conos where you carve down a swell and get backwinded and then carve up the swell and jump and turn around. Like they were, so many of the moves were exact copies of what we've been doing in windsurfing for years and years. And I watched a lot of windsurfers pick up winging and, you know, take to it right away. And that balance and the leaning back and the sheeting in, sheeting out is all really the same. So I really feel that winging is is just so much the same as windsurfing that windsurfers pick it up really easy and the freestyle tricks are are exactly the same like i can just take my skills in windsurfing and translate it directly to the wing that's amazing it still looks scary doing freestyle with like a knife under your board right <laughs> yeah yeah it gets a little more scary with wing i think because in windsurfing your your sail is connected to your your board so as long as you keep holding on to the boom you maintain a certain separation from the foil and from the rig. But when I'm, you know, if I jump and I lose the board in winging, I have no idea where it is. And you're just kind of pulling above your head. Hoping... Just because you pull onto the boom and you know you're going to be away from the foil. In winging, it's a whole other dimension where you better keep your feet in the straps. Otherwise, you better cover your head because you're not sure where that thing's going to land. Yeah, that's a good point. And talking about actually uh, foil, I know you're really technical and I like to talk tech talk with you. So, and people keep asking all the time about length of mast. So can you explain us why would I use a long mast? Why would I use a shorter mast? and how it's gonna help my progression? Yeah, so um, it's a good question for sure. I think, you know, if you're in shallow water, obviously you have to use a shallower mast or if you're, you know, in a reef situation where you might hit the bottom, it can be expensive to have a longer mast. Um, what, at my wing, Resort here in Baja, I usually start people off on a on a 71 centimeter mast, and that's kind of a good medium starting point. When you have that slightly shorter mast, it's it does two things. One, with a 70 centimeter mast, if you breach, you're not going to nosedive as steep. You're going to touch down a little more shallow, so you're going to have you're going to be more likely to be able to breach and touch down without falling. Whereas a 90 centimeter mast, if you breach, you might be pointing pretty far down. Um, not to say you can't recover on a 90, but it is going to be a little bit harder. But in Slingshot, when we started off our whole hover glide program, we had this graduated mass program where we'd start people on really short, like 50 or 60 centimeter, and then you'd go to 70, and then you'd go to 90. And what I found in teaching windsurfing was that, you know, the short mast was less scary. And the reason we did that was to lower foil fear. In the beginning of foiling, there was so much fear of the foil. So having you know, a shorter mast reduced that. But the negative side of the mast is that you have less room and less time to correct your errors. So you know, if you're starting to drop, you have less time before you touch. And if you're starting to breach, you have less time to correct that error before you breach. So what we've been finding is that shorter than 70 is often kind of harder for people because they just, you know, they go from breaching to touching down to breaching to touching down and they don't have any time in there to correct their errors and get things leveled out. So I think that, you know, it can be a little easier to start on 70, but the only real reason to not go with like a 80 or 90 is if you're kind of scared of being at higher, you want to limit the foil fear. I think that the taller mast, most people will actually find easier because they have more time to correct their errors. But if they breach, maybe they're going to crash and have to start again instead of being able to, uh, to kind of save it. So I think 70 is a great place to start. It's less scary. You're going to be able to touch down better, but I wouldn't be scared of going taller because it actually makes it easier because you have more time to correct your errors. Yeah, that makes sense. 
And um, thank you for all those details. What about wing size? I know there's a lot of different sizes, there's high aspects, there's, it's just getting crazy right now and people get confused about what to get and what to start with. Yeah, I think the easy rule there is just that bigger wings are easier than smaller wings. So when you talk about in slingshot, we measure them mostly in, in wing span, the, the width of the wing. And the wider your wingspan is, the more rail to rail stability you're going to have in your board. So when you do pop up, you're going to be more stable rail to rail. And that's just going to make things a lot easier. In, in windsurfing, one of my biggest mistakes in windsurfing was, in windsurf foiling, was that I just wanted to go faster and jump higher right away. And I couldn't jive. <laughs> so so I, I was getting like, you know, two out of 10 jibes. But... You know, every time Tony would bring us a big wing, we'd be, I'd be like, no, I don't want the big wing. Tony, I want a smaller one. I want to go faster, jump higher. And he's like, oh, that's not what you want. You can't even jive. And <laughs> finally, finally, when we got like a, a 76 centimeter wide, 1500 wing, all of a sudden I could ride swell better. My jives went from 20% to 90%. You know, I started to be able to sail backwinded and do car 360s, and it just changed my whole foiling experience to go with that bigger wing. And, you know, that translates into, uh, into winging as well. You know, a bigger wing is to be more stable side to side. You're able to do you know, carving and trying to learn to jive. You can slow down a whole lot more before you stall. So you have more time to switch your feet. The stability of the rail is going to help you switch your feet. Bigger wings are definitely easier. I think the, the one drawback I see teaching people with really big wings is that everybody has too narrow a board. And so the board wants to do a wheelie at really low speeds. And they need to have a much wider, we call it like the Laird Hamilton stance, the super wide stance with a big wing so that you keep the board in the water for longer until you have a higher board speed. And then the board will lift evenly rather than a narrow stance and having this board constantly do a wheelie at slow speed, messing up the beginner. So I think a big wing to start, um, you know, 2000 is not too big. You know, our infinity 99 wide is, you know, 2300. And that's why I'm starting most people off down here, but you just need a real stance to, to control a wing, but it's going to be so much more stable. And the bigger wings are less sharp. They're less scary. Um, I'd say go bigger, don't go smaller. Yes. Go big or go home. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Um, what would you suggest, Wyatt, when uh, when someone is looking at winging, like, oh, whoa, I want to I wanna learn that. What's the best tip you would suggest? The best tip ever, and is one of the reasons why kids get so good at winging so quick, is because kids are spend hours on the beach just like running and jumping off the little dunes and getting hang time and you know playing catch with it and really light winds and you know we have a bunch of kids in hood river that you know these kids spend half of the summer down in the sandbar just running and jumping over puddles or having a little skim board with the wing and puddles before they ever hit the water and then within a couple of days on the water they're you know, blasting back and forth across the river. And what they did in all that time they spent on land was they learned so much wing control. Yeah. And that's the biggest problem I see with people, you know, come to our center and want to learn is you teach them, you know, a 20, 30 minute lesson on the beach. And then they're done with playing with the wing on the beach. They just want to go to the water and then they hit the water and they struggle because they don't, they haven't built their wing skills, you know, and the more time you can spend running up and down the beach, you know, going different directions, jumping and sheeting in, switching hands to the other tack, you know, without falling over a million times and wasting energy, you're building so much wing skill. And so that would be my number one tip for people getting into it is spend four, five, six hours on the beach, running around, playing with it, being overpowered. You know, it's just like in windsurfing is, you know, it's, 
90% sail handling, 20% port skills. And it's the same in wing. It's just, you know, 80% handling wing skills, 20% port skills. Yeah, I love that. That's such a great tips and we forget about and the thing it's just going to make the, the learning curve much faster, right? Because better fall on the beach, just on your bum versus in the water, you have to jump back on the board, you're drifting downwind and you know, you've see, you, you see it all the time. Yeah. And people don't think about that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, everybody wants, thinks that being on the beach with it is a beginner thing and they just want to move past that and right to the water when you know, they're just going to accelerate their learning curve times four if they play with it on the beach for just a few more hours. I mean, three hours, four hours, but don't do it for 20 minutes. You know, most yeah. people want to do 20 minutes and go to the water and two, three hours, then go to the water. Yeah. So, Wyatt, before we started the podcast, uh, you were mentioning that you actually, you're in Baja right now. You're going to head back to Hood River perhaps uh, next week, right? Yeah. So, are you going to start your, your camp back in Hood River? Um, in Hood River, so I do the windsurfing resort here and we travel around and do some uh, windsurf clinics other places. But when I get back to Hood River, that's where Slingshot's based. And and it's just, we're testing and, you know, making new foil academy, how-to videos and, you know, producing product, testing product. Um, you know, all, a lot of the designers are based up there. So Tony Lagos is, is based up there and we'll do photo shoots and I'm organizing all that. So it, when I get there, I'm just, you know, working slingshot all the time and testing and I don't really, teach any lessons up there although this summer we'll be shooting a new uh, foil academy slingshot has like an online course for learning to kite foil wing foil windsurf foil surf foil and we're redoing it this summer so that's going to be a really big project there so i won't be teaching other than video teaching awesome so where people can find you or oh, online or physically yeah online or physically um I actually spend most of the year down here in uh, La Ventana, Baja, California, Mexico. So it's two hours north of Cabo San Lucas is the big airport at the tip of Baja. And we're two hours away from that. And I have a, a windsurfing and wingsurfing center right here on the beach. And uh, it's called prowindsurflaventana.com. Um, and actually, I think this summer I've got to put up a new website that's prowindsurflaventana.com because it's just getting so popular. But uh, we open up in November 1st and we close down at the end of April and it's, uh, you know, the windiest time is middle of winter, December, January, February, it blows over 20 knots most days and down here teaching and we've got ATVs and an open bar and sailboats and we teach behind the jet ski and uh, just a real fun kind of all inclusive place and we got all the gear and because I'm working with Slingshot, we've always got all the prototype gear and gear that hasn't even come out yet, which is real fun for people to come down and, and check out. But yeah, all winter down here teaching at Pro Windsurf La Ventana. Man, I have to come and visit you guys. <laughs> <That's pretty fun. laughs> all right. Anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, it's, I mean, the sport is growing quick and, uh, you know, it's been really crazy with COVID and the uh, disruption in the supply chain. So, you know, don't wait to get that wing gear because I think we'll, you know, I've got the new wing craft board there that's pretty much sold out in the U.S. And nothing is really hitting the, the slingshot warehouses or most of the other brands at this point. You know, it doesn't hit the brand. It doesn't hit the warehouse and stay. It goes straight to dealers and right out the door. So, I think just like last summer, we're going to see a big shortage in gear this summer. So don't wait to get the new toys. If you see them in stock at your local retailer, I would say pick it up right away because wing is just so popular and there's such a huge demand and, you know, there's crazy shipping delays coming out of all the factories. So if you can find gear, get it quick because this summer it's going to be sold out <laughs> i agree i agree for us here in the dr it's just you know looking for gear because it's just the sport is getting more and more popular it so is. Wyatt, how do you see the future of winging the future of winging um i think that the biggest i, I think one of the problems that a lot of the, i think the industry focuses a lot on 
on foiling and it's all about foiling, foiling, foiling. But I think the biggest sector for growth really is the, the sub market, you know, kind of like windsurfing was in the seventies and eighties where, you know, everybody who had a little lake, they have a sup board. And if it gets a little windy, maybe it's only blowing, you know, five, 10 knots, but it makes paddling not so much fun. But I think we need to reach out to that sup audience and show them that, you know, throw a wing on when it gets a little windy and choppy in your lake and you're going to go faster than you've ever paddled that board before. And you're going to learn all these wing skills. And, you know, it's fun to just go cruising back in a lake without the foil. And uh, like at Slingshot, we have a product called the Sup Winder, which is a, a stick on center fin. So you can take any hard sup and you basically, it's a stick on a box that has a big old removable keel fin. And so everybody's got a sup and all you need is a wing and it's like a hundred dollar sup winder, stick it on there and you can teach your kids, you can teach your family, you can have fun when the lake gets a little choppy. And I think that's, if we can reach out to that market of people with sups and lakes um, and get them into winging, even without the foil, then I think, you know, the sport's just really going to have a lot more participants. And that's something the that industry should focus on here because, you know, every little lake gets some wind and everybody's got a sub board and all you need is a wing. Yeah. And it's all about having, well, having fun and being outside. Exactly. Throw the dog and the kids on the front and go cruising across the lake. I mean, that was, that was so much fun and that brought windsurfing to the masses. And I think it'll do the same for wing. Yeah, great. Wyatt, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, good to see you again, Audrey. It's been a few years. We've always had so much fun ripping it up there at your place in the DR. Can't wait to come back. Yeah, we'd love to see you again. All right, so you have a great day, guys. See you on the next, next podcast. Thank you. Bye, Wyatt. Take care, guys. Thank you guys for watching. See you soon on our next Profile Talk with a new guest. Enjoy the ocean.